Usaka Sakabo, and welcome to Read Aloud 10 of Caciques and Semi Idols, the web spun by Taino rulers between Hispaniola and Puerto Rico by Jose R. Oliver. In the last video, we ended um, right at the end of section B in chapter 19, so that's why we're starting at section C in this video. Section C is idolatry, religious persecution, and the destruction of semi idols. The military battles in Hispaniola and Boriquen also entailed the religious persecution of the natives. In addition to the Spaniards, quote, legal and social disempowerment of the indigene peoples came a religious persecution that entailed the destruction of idols and punishment for idolatry, end quote. Let us not forget that the Aireto figures listed among materials sold at auction in Puerto Rico immediately after the 1511 rebellion of the caciques. But the auction of religious paraphernalia as curios was probably not common. Most of the idols that could not be hidden during could not be hidden during this conflicts were almost certainly systematically destroyed by the Spaniards. The hiding of semi idols from the Spanish was done to avoid the capture and destruction of the very instrument of chiefly political religious power, and hiding was done to avert pillage not only from zealot Spaniards but also from the native caciques allied to the Spanish. The rebel caciques probably captured the semi-idols of caciques who were loyal to the Spaniards, although I would expect that rather than destroying them, they were put to the service of their cause. A discreet set of events was recorded by Fray Ramon Pané while he was ordered by Admiral Columbus to go live with the cacique Guarionesh, ruler of the Casigazos, Casigazo of Magua Callabo, around March 1495. These events exemplify the conflicts, struggles, and misunderstandings between Indians and the conquistadors, even pitting native brother against brother. They also highlight the role of religion and the power of images in a way that was disregarded by the chroniclers of the Higüe battles. The iconoclastic persecution to be detailed below is unique in that it is the only detailed written text providing an account of the destruction of religious Christian imagery implemented by the Indians rather than the other way around. It is once again thanks to Fray Ramon Pané that these events were recorded for posterity. Accompanying Pané was Fray, Ju Fray Juan Ludel, or De La Duel, nicknamed El Bermejo, or Borjones, born in the Bergeroni, Bergeroni, I don't know how to say that, guys, I'm sorry. Ludel was a Franciscan monk originating from a monastery in Hainau, Belgium. Fray Juan de Tissin, quote, el francés, end quote, another Franciscan, also from Hainu or Hainut, may well have also accompanied Pané in his mission. Pané, on the other hand, hailed from the monastery of San Jeroni de la Multra in what is now Badalona on the outskirts of Barcelona in the province of Catalonia in northeastern Spain. It now seems likely that it was at San Sant Jeroni that Columbus met the Catholic monarchs on his first return from Hispaniola and not at the Plaza Real in Gothic downtown Barcelona, probably an invention of 19th century Spanish Romanticism. Given that King Ferdinand, who favored the then powerful Hyernimite order, had been at Sant Jeroni in April 1493, recovering from wounds received in a failed assassination attempt, precisely at the steps of the Plaza Real. It is more than likely that Pané's name was suggested to Columbus by King Ferdinand himself or by the prior of the monastery of San Jeroni. Pané and Ludel accompanied Columbus on his second voyage to the Caribbean. By January 2, 1493, Columbus had decided on La Isabela as the site for the new settlement after the fiasco of the La Navidad Fortress. Fray Ramon Pané, who was a lake, i.e. not an ordained priest, was almost certainly at La Isabela, along with seven other clerics, for the first solemn mass conducted by Father Bernardo Buil, or Bernat Boyle, also a Catalan of the Benedictine order, on Epiphany Day, January 6th. Panet and Ludel, perhaps Juan de Tissin, too, left La Isabela for the land of Cacique Maviatue, about which neither Pané nor Ludel left any information, but was probably within range of La Isabela on Macorí Charriba territory. Pané wrote that at the beginning of 1495, he left La Isabela to reside in the fortress of La Magdalena, 
where he lived for about a year under the protection of Captain, Captain Luis de Artiaga. It was while in Magdalena de Pané, a native Catalan speaker, learned the native language of Macorish, which, according to Las Casas, was a, quote, strange, almost barbarian language, end quote, and unlike the, quote, elegantly spoken, end quote, generalized Taino language spoken in the rest of Hispaniola. While the two friars were there, La Magdalena was attacked by the local cacique, Guatiguana, and by other rebellious caciques under Cuanabo's orders, but the fortress was soon liberated by Columbus's men. Toward the end of March 1495, Admiral Columbus ordered Fray Ramon Pane and Fray Juan Ludel to move on to the village of Cacique Guarionesh near another of the fortresses that Columbus had ordered built next to El Verde River named La Concepcion. Because the natives of the Macorish region spoke a different tongue than the generalized Taino language of Hispaniola, Pané and Fray Ludel obtained permission from Admiral Columbus to take, quote, the best of the Indians, end quote, with him, including one named Guaticabanu, who was his most advanced Katashuman instructed in the Catholic faith. Guaticabanu was one of 16 intimate members of the household of Cacique Guanacobonen, who lived in the Macorish region at a site or locality named Nihui, Nihuire. From there, Pane and Ludel traveled with seven Kateshumans, first back to La Isabela in the northwest and later returning to the southeast along the valley toward Guaricano. The natives around Guaricano, i.e. Guarionesh's subjects, spoke Taino. We know this because a large number of native terms in Pane's account are undoubtedly Taino, and closely related to other Caribbean Maypurin languages, as Jose Juan Arom has demonstrated. For the same reason, I also speculate that it was during his stay among Guarionesh's people that Pane collected most of the myths and legends contained in the Relacion. Initially, Cacique Guarionesh welcomed the clerics and the Macorish Cateshumans with grace, and even enrolled his own household in the Catechism convening twice daily to recite the Christian prayers. At this stage, Guarionesh was still reticent to join in the anti-Spanish conspiracy being plotted by 14 caciques. Thus, the catechism lessons continued for about two years, from the spring of 1495 to near the end of 1497 or very early 1498. Meanwhile, Bartolomé Colón was left in charge as adelantado, i.e. an official with military political military functions who governed an advanced territory fronting the enemy, while Christopher Columbus was back in Spain from 1496 to 1498. Spanish native conflicts in the entire region had reached a crescendo during the spring of 1497. Guarionesh was under a lot of pressure from 14 caciques, probably peers, who ultimately succeeded in convincing Guarionesh that he had no choice but to renege on his strategy of tolerance with the Spaniards, because the latter had been usurping the land, carrying out attacks on them, and of course because of the extensive abuses in the gold panning operations around the fort of Santo Tomas near Zanik in the Cibao Mountains. Today's Hanico, the land of Cacique Caonabo, not to mention that the natives simply did not have the means to fulfill the required amounts of tribute in gold. It's quite probable that a secret council and Cojoba meeting was held, as it was in the case of Aguaybara II in Borinque where Guarionesh and the 14 caciques met to deliberate on the best course of action. If so, upon receiving the appropriate signals from his semi-idols, Guarionesh changed his policy of diplomatic tolerance for one of active resistance, joining the 14 caciques. The plan was to take advantage of the day when the caciques paid the tributes, mainly gold, to the Spanish so as to gain access into the fortress and thus launch a surprise attack. Pedro Martín de Angreria, noted that Bartolomé Colón had learned beforehand that Guarionesh had been chosen by the other caciques as their commander-in-chief to lead some 15,000 native troops to battle. It's very doubtful that such a decision would have been made without due invocation of, and assent by, via Cojoba ceremony, the appropriate contingent of semi-idols under the control of Guarionesh and also those controlled by the other 14 caciques. Guarionesh's decision was soon felt by Pané, resulting in his and the Cateshumans' hurried departure, if not ejection, from the Guaricano settlement. Pané headed towards the village of another, quote, principal cacique, end quote, named Mabiatue, or Mahubiati Bire, quote, 
who had continued to be of goodwill towards Catholic indoctrination for three years now, saying he wishes to be a Christian and who wants to have but one wife, although they usually have two or three, and the principal men have 10, 15, and 20, end quote. The precise location of Mabiatue's domain is unknown. Perhaps it was an area closer to the Magdalena, La Isabela region, or more likely to either the Bonao area or Santo Domingo, where Bané was deposed in an inquest against the Columbus brothers, Cristobal, Bartolomé, and Diego, presided by Comendador Bobadilla. Guarionesis's decision was soon felt by Bané, resulting in his and the catechumens' hurried departure, if not ejection, from the Guaricano settlement. Yeah, I went ahead and looked that word up. It was killing me. Bané headed towards the village of another, quote, principal cacique, end quote, named Mabiatue, or Mahubiatibire, quote, who had continued to be of goodwill toward Catholic indoctrination for three years now, saying he wishes to be a Christian and who wants to have but one wife, although they usually have two or three, and the principal men have 10, 15, and 20, end quote. The precise location of Mabiatue's domain is unknown. Perhaps it was an area closer to the Magdalena, La Isabela region, or more likely to either the Bonao area or Santo Domingo, where Pané was deposed in an inquest against the Columbus brothers, Cristobal, Bartolomé, and Diego, presided by Comendador Bobadilla. Pané's whereabouts were unknown until Consuelo Varela recently located documents pertaining to the inquest against the Columbus brothers, ordered by the Spanish monarchs and presided by the new governor, Comendador Francisco de Bobadilla, during the late autumn of 1500. Banez's deposition is important because it shows that he was in either Bonao or Santo Domingo in 1500 and because his testimony contradicts some aspects of the text of the Relacion that came down to the present through Hernando Colón via Alfonso de Ulloa and Pedro Martí de Anglería. It is possible that either the imprisoned Columbuses or Bobadillas' envoys took Banez's famous Relacion back to Spain, reaching Cadiz in November 1500, giving Martí a chance to read Banez's document. The key point of discrepancy is that Christopher Columbus had forbidden the natives to be baptized, contradicting the Relación. The admiral made it very difficult for Bané and the other missionaries to accomplish their ultimate task of converting the natives. Columbus wanted them to first have the natives indoctrinated, i.e. taught the Ave Maria, Pater Noster, Credo, etc., but not baptize. The reason behind this was to exclude the native women from being legally recognized in marriage with Spaniards and to avoid the problems of mestizaje, i.e. the legal status of the offspring that results from Indian-Spanish sexual relations, at a time when the crown forbade such unions. Equally important, natives who were not baptized and were captured in battle could be enslaved and sold in Spain. By 1500, Varela estimates that more than 1,500, quote, indios, end quote, had been enslaved by Christopher Columbus alone. The accusation was very serious. Admiral Columbus was impeding the Indians from being converted to the Catholic faith, contravening Queen Isabella's express edict to convert them. She regarded them as her vassals, though the queen often wavered over the issue of vassalage versus slavery. Unfortunately, Panez's deposition did not mention the incident of the desecration of Christian icons in Guaricano, Guayonesh's town. What happened in that incident is this. Frustrated because of Columbus's, quote, no baptism, end quote, policy, and because of Guarionesh's joining the rebellion, Pané had left for Santo Domingo. He also left behind in Guaricano, circa 1497, several of the catechumens from Guanaocomonel's household as custodians of the makeshift chapel, probably nothing fancier than a boillo, where the Catholic wooden images were kept for veneration. Guarionesh then ordered six of his men to take the Christian idols by force. Once taken, the images were buried in a conuco where the men then urinated on them while reciting, quote, now your fruits will be good and great, end quote, which the Spanish interpreted as scorn and vituperation. Some native catechumens rescued the Christian statues from the conuco and hid them, and then sent someone to inform Adelantado Bartolome Colón of the incident. The Adelantado captured the culprits and ordered them to be burned alive at the stake. Notwithstanding the execution, ordered, Guarionesh ordered the Christians killed, four were killed, including Juan Mateo, 
Guaticabalu's Christian name and also commanded that the Christian images be destroyed. Some time later, the field where the images had been buried and urinated on was harvested and a large sweet potato in the shape of a cross was found. Both Pane and Guarionesh's mother, whom Pane said was, quote, the worst woman in these parts, end quote, took it for a miracle. These events show how the men sent by Guarionesh interpreted and used Christian images as if they were semi-idols with analogous supernatural potency as Arom had originally suggested. At the same time, Guarionesh also had to destroy the images as they were equally interpreted as powerful beings that worked against the integrity of his polity. They were, quote, feeding, end quote, the enemy by making crops grow. In reverse, the Spanish executed Guarionesh's iconoclasts for heretics and legitimized the righteousness of the Christian faith vested in these images by telling about the miracles of the cross-shaped tuber. Guarionesh's mother did express wonderment, but perhaps not surprised that the Christian, quote, semis, end quote, yielded what would be expected from the natives' three-pointed semi-idols. Carlos Esteban Deive, Deve, I'm not sure, however, suggests an alternate, alternative motive for Guarionesh's men urinating on the Catholic images. He suggests that it's also possible that it was a deliberate act of desecration. They did so to openly score the Spanish and deny the legitimacy of the imposed Catholic religion. He suggests that the whole doctrinal acquiescence by Guarionesh and his people was a pretense, much in the same way that African slaves pretended to pray to Santiago or St. James and other saints when in fact they were worshipping their native African orichas or deities like Chango or Obatala whose icons were literally hiding behind the Catholic images or had, quote, mounted, end quote, or entered the saint's body. He asks, what other reason could there be for Guarionesh's mother's surprise when she witnessed the miraculously cross-shaped sweet potato? Davis' view is plausible and depends on how one interprets the comment made by the natives while urinating that it makes crops grow. It's either a direct literal statement or one uttered with, the contempt, with contempt and sarcasm. But even if the statement was one of scorn, it doesn't diminish my argument that it's almost certain that most natives saw and understood the Catholic images as the semi-analogs of the Spanish religious icons. The fact is that they were destroyed, suggesting a combination of scorn, contempt, and yes, fear, because these Catholic images were undoubtedly seen as a threat to the safety and integrity of their way of life. Little has survived in the Spanish writings describing the destruction of semi-idols, but there is no question of their systematic destruction and persecution. The natives were hiding them anywhere they could, examples in caves, in forests, in jagues, so that neither the Spanish nor the caciques allied with them could get their hands on their idols. This story encapsulates an iconoclastic struggle that, sadly, the native loyalists would not win. The destruction of powerful native semi-idols, along with the, quote, decapitation, end quote, of entire chiefly lineages and heirs, ruptured the web of political, economic, and military alliances and enmities that the caciques had spun for centuries. Their daily life and routines were changed irrevocably. Whether in peace or in war, whether in alliances or competition, marriage exchanges, kidnapping women, playing ball games or chanting and dancing, they did so under agreed and understood principles of right and wrong, justice and injustice, that were theirs to pursue and uphold or not. From that first genocide in January 1493 at the Golfo de la Flecha in Samana, their destiny was no longer in their hands. Chapter 20. The Virgin Mary Icons and Native Semis, Two Cases of Religious Syncretism in Cuba. Antonio Curet reminded me of yet another case of a clash of idols, but this time involving two native actors in Cuba, one wielding a native semi and the other a Catholic image of the, quote, Virgin Mother of God, end quote. A witness relayed the events to, Pe to Pedro Martí de Anglería in Spain. Martí included the account in his famous De Orbe Novo de Cades in the sixth book, in the sixth book of his second decade. And... Epistle written to Pope Leo X. The informant of the key event was Martin Fernandez de Inciso, or Bachiller Anciso, as Martin identified him. Here I use the former spelling Inciso, except when quoting Martin. 
He was a first-hand informant. In Pedro Martir's own words, quote, I wanted beatific father, Pope Leo X, to refer to you these details regarding the religion of the natives that I have learned not only from Francisco but also many other persons of authority so that your beatitude may understand how docile is this race of men and how easily is the road to instruct them in the rights of our religion, end quote. It's possible that when Martin wrote the epistle, the story had been embellished so as to highlight the triumphs of Christianity over paganism and to affirm to Pope Leo X that the native souls of Cuba were primed for conversion, a fact refuted later by Gonzalo Fernández de Oviedo y Valdés. The privileges of Christopher Columbus's son, Don Diego, were partly restored in 1509. Upon returning that year to Hispaniola, Don Diego named Alonso de Ojeda, also spelled Ojeda without an H, and Diego de Nicuesa as governors of the fledgling Spanish dominions of Urabá and Veraguas in the Isthmus of Panama, Colombia, respectively. The fame of Martín Fernández de Enciso was in connection to his involvement in the penetration and conquest of the Darien and the establishment in 1510 of Nuestra Señora de la Antigua, located next to the Atralto River, Gulf of Urabá, in what is now Colombia. Because of factional competition, Vasco Núñez del Balboa expelled Enciso in the spring of 1511 because Enciso, quote, had never been a friend since he had threatened to have Balboa placed on a desert island when he was discovered as a stowaway on his vessel to flee from creditors in Santo Domingo, end quote. As a result, Enciso set sail for Santo Domingo that spring of 1511, but unknowingly veered into Cuba. Around the time Martín Fernández de Enciso arrived, the situation in Cuba was taking a turn for the worse. In 1509, Sebastián Ocampo circumnavigated the area, confirming, that most, confirming what most sailors in Hispaniola already knew. Cuba was an island. The conquest of Cuba began early in 1511 and was led as well as financed by Diego Velázquez de Cuellar, a Hidalgo. A Hidalgo is a, is a nobleman, by the way. He was accompanied, among others, by his secretary, Hernán Cortés, future conqueror of the Aztec Empire, Fray Bartolomé de las Casas, already ordained in 1508, and Juan Goncales, the son of Juan Ponce de León, who had just left the battlefield of the 1511 rebellion of Caciques of Puerto Rico. Velázquez set out to conquer Cuba from the makeshift wooden fortress in Baracoa, northeastern Cuba. He cruelly defeated the local native resistance led by Cacique Hathaway. This cacique had led from what is today Haiti, where Velázquez had his estates and organized the resistance in Baracoa. Legend has it that the captive Hathaway was burned alive at the stake for refusing Christianity. Quote, he's supposed to have said that if Christianity meant that he had to spend eternity in the company of Spaniards, he would prefer not to be baptized, end quote. Velázquez was then joined by Panfilo de Narvaez, just, a, just arrived from the conquest of Jamaica led by Juan de Esquivel, the same Esquivel who led the Battle of Higüey, Hispaniola. As Velázquez moved across the Oriente province, Narvaez had already defeated the native resistance in Bayamo, claiming 100 dead, led by a cacique named Caguash, who had replaced Hathaway. The Spaniards were persecuting the fleeing Indians towards Camagüey when they reached a settlement called Cueva, or Cueva, probably located between Manzanillo and Bayamo. Chapter 20, Section A, The Flemish Virgin Mary of Ojeda at Cueva. It was at Cueva where Narvaez's men found the natives worshipping the image of the Virgin Mary. This statue of the Virgin Mary in Cueva was left by Alonso de Ojeda on what was his last return trip from Urabá to Santo Domingo, where he died later in 1515. His ship did not make it and instead floundered in a large bay in the, quote, province of Chagua, end quote, where the city of Cienfuegos is today. In several 19th century maps, this area was still called Bay of Chagua or Jagua, and the region was known as Fernandina de Jagua. Ojeda and the Spaniards traveled some, quote, 100 leagues, end quote, approximately 483 kilometers, east towards Bayamo and the site of Cueva. 
Ojeda noted Las Casas, quote, had in his rucksack an image of Nuestra Señora, Our Lady, exquisitely painted, made in Flanders, that the bishop Don Juan de Fonseca, secretary of King Ferdinand, had gifted him, end quote. The Spaniards were in dire straits and lost for 30 days in a huge swamp for which reason Ojeda had every opportunity, quote, pulled out from his rucksack the image, placed her on a tree, and there he venerated her, begging her to remedy or save them, end quote. By the time they reached Cueva, already half of the 70 shipwrecked Spaniards had either drowned or died of hunger. In Cueva, the local natives received the starved Spaniards with hospitality and nursed them back to good health. The local chief even sent a rescue party to the swamp in search of the rest of the survivors. Ojeda had made a solemn promise, ex voto, that he would leave his statue of Our Lady in the first village where he could find succor at Cueva. He gave the icon to the señor of the village and ordered him to build an oratory or chapel, chapel with an altar where he, Ojeda, put her, the statue of Our Lady, and offering some instruction to the Indians about God as best as he could communicate telling them that she was the mother of God, that he was in heaven, Lord and God of all the world, that she was named Santa Maria, advocate of men. It was admirable to see the devotion and reverence they, Indians, had towards this image that they had henceforth, and how ornate the church was with clothes made of cotton, and how well swept and clean it was. They had couplets made in their language and accompanied with, strong, with song and dance. Las Casas said he and Narvaez arrived a, quote, few days later, end quote, after this event in pursuit of the rebel cacique Caguash. And that brings up a second event relating to this image of Our Lady. Among Narvaez's soldiers, there was some of Ojeda's survivors who were devoted to this virgin icon. They pressed on the padre, or company priests, to recover the icon from this cacique. Although the padre had another image of the Virgin Mary, also sculptured in Flanders, the men were not as devoted to her as they were to Ojeda's Our Lady. During a great meal prepared by the natives, the padre offered the cacique to exchange his Virgin Mary for theirs, i.e. Ojeda's. The cacique then, quote, stood up, downcast, end quote, and pretended to hide his disappointment as best he could. At night, he grabbed the icon and, quote, took off to the hills with her, end quote. The next morning, as the priest readied for mass, he found out that the icon was gone and was informed by the natives that their cacique had run away to hide her, afraid the Spanish would take her away. Despite various attempts to entice the cacique to return, he refused. Indeed, quote, for the security of the icon, end quote, he did not return until the Spanish continued their colonizing expedition towards Camagüey, westward, still some 20 leagues or 97 kilometers away. Las Casas marveled at the devotion these natives had to the Virgin of Nuestra Señora, or Our Lady, and that they composed couplets and songs and danced aretos in her honor. Led by Naraves, the expedition continued through several native villages and ended up in a settlement called Caunao. It's here that the events led to the massacre of around 2,000 natives. This was the event that turned Las Casas from a conquistador and encomendero to the, quote, defender of the Indians, end quote, even though at the time he was already ordained. In a short time, Las Casas would follow the example of his Dominican brethren, Fray Pedro de Cordoba and Fray Anton de Montesinos, in denunciating the ill treatment of Amerindians. By 1514, the Spaniards had already founded seven settlements, all in or adjacent to native villages, Baracoa in 1511, Bayamo in 1513, Trinidad in 1514, Santi Spiritus, Puerto Principe, or Camagüey, Santiago, and San Cristobal de la Habana in its original location on Batanamo Bay on the south coast, these last four also in 1514. The old Havana was relocated to its present location between 1519 and 1526. Section B, the painted virgin image of Cacique Comendador. Martin Fernandez de Enciso must have arrived in Cuba shortly after Ojeda, but it was probably at the same time as or earlier than Velázquez and Narváez began their push for colonization in 1511. 
unlike Ojeda, and Cecil did not suffer any trivial travail while moving along the coast of Cuba. Sorry about that. At some locality, perhaps between Camagüey and Bayamo, and Cecil encountered a local chief or cacique who introduced him as Cacique Comendador. He liked and appropriated this Spanish title, which he had heard in reference to the former governor of Santo Domingo, Comendador Mayor Nicolás de Obando. This appropriation no doubt says much about the importance of naming in relation to caciques. This method of name acquisition contrasts with Guatillao, the formal name exchange ritual already noted as taking place in Hispaniola in Puerto Rico, but it is consonant with titles of grandeur, usually celestial bodies or brilliant things, such as Ture, for sky, with which prominent caciques were invested. Cacique Comendador told Enciso that a party of Spaniards had left a sick Spanish sailor in his care. Once recovered, in gratitude, the sailor taught the Cacique Comendador's troops new warfare tactics and helped them in their, quote, usual, end quote, attacks against other native rivals. The reason they, they thereafter always came out victorious. The sailor was a pious devotee of the Virgin Mother of God. He always carried an image of her, quote, beautifully painted in a piece of paper, end quote, perhaps meaning in a parchment or linen, and quote, sewn to his chest, end quote. The sailor assured Cacique Comendador that the reason for the victorious raids was because he was backed by the virgin icon, and he further added that, quote, he counseled Comendador, end quote, writes Martin, quote, that he banished all his semis to whom they rendered cult because they believed them to be nocturnal ghosts, voracious destroyers of souls, end quote. The sailor, quote, persuaded them to adopt the Blessed Virgin Mother of God if they wished to secure their businesses in peace as well as in war, end quote. The cacique then, quote, begged, end quote, the sailor to give him the garment with the virgin sewn in it, and then he, quote, consecrated a temple and altar, end quote. Although Martin said that cacique comendador henceforth, quote, disdained, end quote, the semis venerated for so many generations, the statement seems to me to be an embellishment of either Enciso or, more likely, Martin himself, so as to curry the grace and favor of Pope Leo X, to whom he was writing. But if the report is accurate, this disdain for native iconography and its replacement by Christian iconography, even when both are still regarded as semis and form part of semiism, is a key turning point as a significant and physical element of Tainones had been rejected. In any event, Comendador and his people, quote, of both sexes, end quote, entered the shrine, knelt down, and recited the, quote, Ave Maria, end quote, over and over, as only very few had learned a few more words of this prayer. Upon Enciso's arrival, Cacique Comendador took him by the hand and proudly showed the house where the Virgin painted on, quote, paper, end quote, was kept. He pointed to the Virgin image, which was, quote, surrounded by some pollos, original Latin podium, like a bench, where there were necklaces and ceramic vessels full of food and water. These are the offerings that, instead of sacrifices, they take to the Virgin, reminiscent of the ancestral cult to the Semis. They explain that the reason for such offerings was to avoid that the image spurred by hunger would find no food, end quote. The cacique told Enciso of yet another story involving the anonymous sailor. On one occasion when the sailor, wearing the virgin image, was locked in combat, quote, the semis of the enemy started to tremble, end quote, and, quote, turn their faces, end quote, away from her, to which Martir, not Enciso, inserted the comment that, quote, it is known that both bands always have the semis accompanying, accompanying them so that they help them. End quote, in these battles. The natives affirmed and see saw that they were aided in battle not just by the image of the Virgin, but by, quote, a beautiful lady full of life, elegantly attired with the white dress, end quote. Whereas the enemy said that she was, quote, a woman with a scepter who, with a menacing attitude, favored their opponents, end quote. And that upon seeing such an apparition, quote, their hearts filled with terror. End quote. Section C, the ritual contest between Virgin Mary and the native Semis. 
After the sailor had been rescued by the Spanish, Cacique Comendador continued to engage in regular, quote, bitter disputes, end quote, with a neighboring rival group on the issue of which of the semis were more, quote, saintly, end quote, and more powerful, the virgin or the native ones. These arguments often ended in open, bloody conflicts. One day, the two rival caciques made a pact to resolve their differences by selecting warriors from each band to engage in one-to-one -one combat at an agreed location. On that day, the hands of one young man from each band were tied behind his back. The victor would be the one whose hands, whose tied hands were liberated miraculously by the power of his semi. Each would loudly proclaim, proclaim the superiority of his semi. The cacique comendador's opponents invoked their native semi three times, and each time it failed to deliver. But when comendador's warriors invoked the virgin, a miracle occurred. The virgin appeared, quote, dressed in white, making the devil, or the opponent, Semi, run away, and then placing her scepter on the ligatures of her protected, or warrior. He was suddenly freed in front of the eyes of the other, all the while the rope that was used to tie the Comendador's warriors moved to his rival, so that the opponent found the opponents found the opponent young man liberated while theirs was tied up with double ropes, end quote. But there's more. Comendador's opponents thought there was some sort of trickery involved rather than any, quote, divine, end quote, semi-power. So the challenge was repeated, this time with four men on each side, with the same result. After Comendador's rivals invoked their native semis, the entire assembly saw the appearance of the, quote, devilish semis with their tails and enormous teeth, hor teeth horns, similar to the ones they have represented in a handmade effigy, who started to untie the man to whom each semi was dedicated to, end quote. As this occurred, Comendador invoked the Virgin Mary, and she appeared as already described above. Her apparition resulted in the rival semi fleeing the scene, and like before, the ropes tying Comendador's men ended up instead tying the hands of the rival combatants. This victory of the Virgin Mary over the quote, devilish looking, end quote, native semis was such a notorious event throughout all neighboring groups in the region that as soon as word came that the Spanish were on their way and Ciso and his men arriving in Cueva, they sent messengers to seek, quote, priests to baptize them, end quote. Again, here I am suspicious that Martir and or Enciso was embellishing the tale for the benefit of Pope Leo X. It is perhaps more likely that all were after their Christian semi, a Virgin Mary, or any other, in order to maintain political and military parity with Cacique Comendador. The expanding reputation of Comendador's painted Virgin Semi confirms my previous arguments about how Taino and Semi icons, once sculptured, begin to accrue a biography and reputation in coordination with the human trustees' actions. Their value as numinous and potent icons increases in the public eye. Section D, Indo-Cuban Semiism Compared. From the two events, the adoption and appropriation of Ojeda's Virgin Mary, a sculptured figure, and Comendador's use of Our Lady's image, a painted image, several inferences can be made. Let us begin at Cueva with Ojeda's icon. This icon, made of wood and apparently polychrome painted, was willingly adopted by the local cacique and treated as if it were a native semi. One of the first things that the Cuban cacique did was to have the icon housed in a boyo structure that seems to have been exclusively devoted to the Virgin Mary icon. However, this does not imply that other semi-icons were not also stored and honored in this boyo. I also suspect that other native semi-icons accompanied the Comendador's virgin icon. I would be surprised if the cacique and the combatants did not also wear semi-icons as part of their attire, as body decorations, or carry the icons with them in, for example, a cotton bag, such as a miniature three-pointed stone. In terms of ritual, just like the natives of Guaricano and Hispaniola, the Virgin was given offerings of food, though it is not mentioned if such offerings were linked to a first harvest, as indicated in Panay's account for Hispaniola. The Virgin, like other semis, 
was the focus of reverence and ritual invocation. Couplets were sung and dances were performed in her honor. Like native semis, the virgin at the shrine in the Boio or out in the ritual combat was apprehended from a multinatural and animistic perspective. It can be surmised that the cacique of Cueva received only the barest of Catholic instruction about who the Virgin Mary was, possibly learning formulaic phrases, probably in Latin, such as the ritualistic repetition of Ave Maria, Ave Maria, in order to invoke her. Elements of the biography of the Virgin as the Mother of God would find resonance with other native feminine semi-idols, for example, Atavira, Macorish, or Magua in Hispaniola, and their biographies as Maria Elsa Trincado has aptly noted. From the perspective of the Cueva natives, the Virgin was, therefore, one more semi incorporated into their ensemble of numinous icons controlled by their cacique. It did certainly help that the Cueva natives witnessed the genuine, authentic devotions that Ojeda and his men had for the Virgin Mary icon the fact that she was responsible for saving them from death in the swamps. The same processes seem to have been involved in the initial adoption of icons, saints or virgins, by Guarionesh and his family, but the details of how they and other natives in Macorish and Magua, Magua venerated the Christian icons are unknown. It is also worth pointing out the importance of the exotic, remoteness that the Christian images would have had for the natives, the virgin icons, did really come from afar, a world beyond, thus adding to their value and desirability. In other instances, as when Velázquez began the conquest of Cuba in earnest, it would also be evident to the natives that the Christian icons were powerful allies to have in warfare. Much more often than not, the Spaniards emerged victorious. The icons that Pane gifted to Guariones and Hispaniola were received when a number of caciques in the Macorish, Magua, and Maguana regions had already been subjugated by the force of the Spanish. But recall that Guariones received them in a context where he still had not agreed to an alliance when the rebel caciques, with the rebel caciques, and may well have initially accepted the Christian icons for political strategic region, reasons. The destruction of the Christian idols in Guaricano did not take place until Guarionesh was forced to join the rebellion. In contrast, Cacique Comendador and the Cacique of Cueva received the Virgin Mary, quote, semis, end quote, of their own free will, not under pressure. Upon Narvaez, upon Narvaez's arrival sometime later, the Spaniards, egged on by Ojeda's surviving companions, attempted to recover the Virgin icon. It is instructive to pay close attention to the Spanish side of the negotiation. The Spaniards wanted the original Virgin Mary back. It was that and not the other icon that performed the miracle of saving them. Seemingly, it did make a difference that Ojeda's Virgin was the authentic miracle performer. Again, this is an instance of how a demonstrable reputation and building legendary status increases value and desirability. That the Cueva... Cueva Cacique refused to exchange his virgin, quote, semi, end quote, for another one like her, but of unknown reputation, is just as illuminating, but there could be other reasons for refusing. It may have to do with the etiquette of gift giving. It was a gift from Ojeda to the Cacique, which may have made the Cacique duty bound not to exchange it for another icon, even when it was of similar form. Both virgins were sculpted in the Flemish style. But I believe the key reason for the caciques refusing the exchange is the fact that he already had proof of the potency and power of Ojeda's virgin. The other virgin was an unknown quantity. His reaction to the predicament was, I think, rather predictable. He ran away to hide the virgin, much in the same way that the chroniclers said the natives of Hispaniola and Puerto Rico hid their semi-icons from their rivals and competitors, Spanish and natives alike. One fascinating aspect of both the Cueva and Comendador accounts is that when the caciques accepted the virgin icon, she was already sculptured or painted and imbued with numinous power, i.e. semi-like. This provides two instances where the semis, or the virgins, 
along with their attached legends, Mother of God, were accepted from strangers like Ojeda or the sailor. By, quote, accepted, end quote, I do not imply that the legend and biography was understood by the natives in the same terms as the Catholic Ojeda or the sailor understood it, inasmuch as Ojeda or the sailor may have also understood it differently from an expert theologian from the Vatican. These accounts lend credibility to the argument made earlier in this book that at least in parts of Hispaniola and Puerto Rico, foreign, powerful semi-icons could and were accepted by the natives into their, quote, pantheon, end quote, and that they, quote, sat, end quote, comfortably in the company of all the local, non-foreign semis gathered in the Cane. In the long pre-Columbian history, how often did such exchanges of foreign religious artifacts occur? What effects would such exchanges have had in formulating the varying expressions of Tainones? The rivals of Cacique Comendador displayed their already made semis in combat as icons and as spirits or ghost-like apparitions. Section E, Magic, Miracles, and Fetishism, To Believe or Not to Believe. The case of Cacique Comendador reveals other aspects of native idolatry, namely their beliefs about magic, miracles, and fetishism. Initially, the Spanish sailor accompanied by the Virgin would invariably defeat Comendador's neighboring rivals in battle. The Virgin semi-icon was worn on the chest, not unlike the personal semi-icons, such as necklace pendants, for example, worn by the natives. In contrast to Ojeda's Virgin icon, whose miracle was to protect people from dire circumstances, for Comendador and his men, the painted virgin icon's power was clearly associated with victory in battle, regardless of what, whatever else the sailor taught them about the mother of God. It can be inferred that they believed it was through her magic power that the miracle of consistent victories was achieved. What happened after the Spanish sailor was rescued by a passing Spanish vessel is the best available description of the role that some semi-icons played in native versus native warfare. The new warfare strategies learned from the sailor and backed by the Virgin Mary semi gave a military edge over Comendador's neighboring rival caciques, thus creating a destabilizing atmosphere. This was amply demonstrated in real combat when the sailor commanded Comendador's warriors to repeated victories. This situation also generated what Bachiller Anciso, in Martyr's account, described as a bitter argument over who had the most potent icons. Again, this recalls the quote from Oviedo and other chroniclers about how Caciques and Hispaniola bragged about having the best and most powerful icons and vindicates my argument that one cannot continually brag without concrete favorable results. At some point, the cacique will have to provide the evidence that backs up his or her claims. This is precisely what transpired in the case of Comendador and his rivals. Bragging had to be resolved with proof. The disputes of the two rival caciques were wielded in the battlefield. However, it would seem that the warfare strategies Comendador learned were not as effective as they might have been in the absence of the Spaniards. This assumption is supported only by the fact that battle confrontations continued and went unresolved. There was no clear victor. Probably the loss of life had led both caciques to resolve conflicting conflict using a different tactic. The scale of the confrontation was reduced and, in this instance, brought under ritual control through personal combats. It's reminiscent of the varying degrees of managing conflict from personal matches all the way to full-scale battle reported for many societies worldwide. Example, the Yanomamo of Venezuela, Guiana, Brazil. It will be recalled that the challenge was to have one's own hands untied by the magical power of the semi. The pertinent details are, one, the confrontation of the rival men, each with their protector semi icon, two, the invocation, invocation of the semi to untie the ligatures, Three, the magical apparition of the semi envisioned as a spirit or ghost. And four, the miracle of the ropes ending up in the rival's hands, double binding him. Taken at face value and suspending my westernized disbelief and agnosticism, it is clear that all present claim they, quote, saw the virgin, end quote, icon, and quote, the native semi, end quote, in action and performing the miracle. 
and Ciso and then Martin were equally accepting of the magical and miraculous events performed by the numinous virgin and native Semis, only for them, the Semis were personifications of the devil. It's not clear who wore or held the icon of the virgin, the combatant or comendador. In any case, either the static icon must be understood as having some kind of spiritual double or ghost-like reflection, or it was, quote, seen, end quote, and having become physically disembodied in performing the acts described. Most fascinating is the issue of disbelief, not coming from me as a Westerner, but coming from the Comendador's rivals. A second challenge was requested by the Comendador's rivals because of their disbelief. There was a suspicion that trickery or falsehood was involved. As David Graeber astutely noted, what is interesting about such magic tricks is precisely that they call for the suspension of belief. Quote, one reason why anthropologists don't really like the word magic is that it too closely allied to it is too closely allied to self-conscious illusions and tricks. It is no coincidence that when most people in America think of magic, nowadays they think of men in tuxedos pulling rabbits out of hats. I'm suggesting, though, that this is precisely what's interesting about it, end quote. Graeber then adds that it is best to conceptualize magic around two features. First of all, that it's not inherently fetishistic in that it recognizes that the power to transform the world ultimately goes back to human intentions. That is, even if alienated forces or invisible spirits of one sort or another are involved, the action always begins with some human intention and ends with some tangible result. Second of all, it always involves a certain degree of skepticism, a hesitation between stating that the power involved is something mysterious and extraordinary and that it's simply a matter of, quote, social effects, end quote, which in some cases means simply being aware that power is some sort of scam, but that it does not make it any less real or significant. Just as Graeber notes that the Maori in New Zealand informants hesitated between a theological and a magical source for the hidden Maori, the source of semi-potency is called into question by the indigenous Cubans. Finally, the point made by Graeber in his analysis of Cloud Levi Strauss's The Sorcerer and His Magic on Guacuto, Guaca shamans is that whether it is a trick or not is ultimately irrelevant. While curers, for instance, can hardly help but know that much of what they're doing is a stage illusion or a performance, they also think that since it does cure people on some level, it must be true. So again, tricks are of no significance. Curers, curers genuine or not, are clearly powerful and influential people. It means that anyone watching a performance was aware that the person in front of them might be one whose power was based only in the ability to convince others that they had it, and that it seems to me, op and that it seems to me, opens the way for some possibly profound insights into the nature of social power. I think that Graeber's arguments are just as applicable in apprehending precisely what transpired during the ritual combats. Despite initial disbelief, the rivals were overwhelmed by the second performance of Comendador and his combatants and his virgin Semi. But it's not quite that the rivals were overwhelmed. Their versions of the events is not known. Rather, what is known is the virgin Comendador told Twenciso. To paraphrase Graeber, Comendador, as the influential leader of those men who watched the ritual combat, was the person whose power rested on his ability to convince the audience. Had not the virgin icon led them to victory countless times? Yes, she did lead them to victory. Thus, whether Comendador was embellishing the event is not the crucial point, but rather his performance in retelling the story to Enciso. It ought to be remembered that this event was narrated for the benefit of Enciso, who was not a witness, but who readily accepted Comendador's account or performance, one that reached all the way to Pope Leo X in Rome, and that is power. Okay, so I think we're getting close to the one hour mark. So I'm going to go ahead and stop here at chapter 21. And this is where we will pick up on the next video.